topic of um, the lecture this evening is the Westminster Confession and Logic. The way I've structured these lectures is that for six days I'll talk for the first two classes uh, about some of the more technical aspects of the study of logic, and then in the third lecture each evening, uh, talk about how logic affects or applies to certain things such as the Westminster Confession, science, um, apologetics, and uh, we'll study how Christ and Paul use logic in the Gospels, in, in Acts, and in the Epistles. Um, the final lecture is sort of freestanding. It doesn't require that you uh, attend the first two lectures, but it certainly would be helpful if you did. Uh, but it is the final lecture each day will be freestanding on its own uh, as sort of background and a topic of more general interest than might the first two lectures be. The topic for this evening is the Westminster Confession of Logic. If you would, turn to the first chapter of the Westminster Confession, if you have it. Um, it's in the blue hymnal. If you have a blue hymnal nearby, look in the back. There you will find the text of the first chapter of the Confession. I think the hymn, they were all mailed copies of it. The, the, the section of that chapter one that is relevant, directly relevant for our purposes this evening is section six. And I'll put it on the overhead so that, um, you can see the words there as well. This is what the Westminster Confession says, and it's in the embedded in the chapter on Scripture, the first chapter of the Confession, which is also the longest chapter of the Confession, the most important chapter of the Confession. Uh, the Westminster theologians place the Bible first in their order because it is the source of all the information contained not only in the first chapter, but the subsequent 32 chapters. They showed a much greater philosophical insight in doing this than did some authors of other confessions which did not start with the Bible. The Westminster Confession starts with the Bible. And here in section 6 of chapter 1, they write, The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Now this is a profoundly important statement. This is a longer version, if you will, of the axiom of Christianity. Notice the words that I have put in bold and italicized. The word whole, the word all, the word nothing, and the word any. A logician would refer to those words as universals. They cover everything, no exception. The whole counsel of God, not just a part, the whole thing, concerning all things, not just a few things, not many things, not even most things, all things. They're claiming that the Bible is sufficient. All things necessary for God's own glory, his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture. What does expressly set down in Scripture mean? It means it's there in so many words. It's explicit. Explicit. It's not implicit. It says it's either explicit, expressly set down in Scripture, or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. We've already talked about deduction. There you find it in the Confession. Good and necessary consequence is necessary implication. Necessary inference, unto which nothing, doesn't say unto which a few things may be added, it says unto which nothing at any time is to be added, 
And then they specifically excluded new revelations of the spirit and traditions of men. Now the reformers in the 16th and still in the 17th century, when the confession was written, faced two great opponents. One was the Roman Catholic Church, which taught that it was superior to scripture. The Roman Church taught then and teaches today that the church made the Bible. The Bible did not make the church. The church made the Bible, and the church by its traditions can add to the Bible or subtract from the Bible. And that's what they're specifically denying here when they talk about traditions of men. Secondly, their great opponent was the enthusiasts, that is, those who claimed they heard the voice of God, that God was giving them special revelations, that they were having private messages from God, that they heard God's voice, and God particularly the spirit, told them what to do. Uh, the 20th century phenomenon of the charismatic movement is not new. It was common in the 16th century. And the enthusiasts were claiming that the spirit had given them new revelations, which were in addition to the Bible. They may have believed in the Bible, but they say we've gotten specific guidance on this point from God, from the spirit. The Westminster theologians de uh, denied both claims. They said, everything you need to know, the whole council, everything you need to know is found in the Bible either explicitly or implicitly. And if it's implicit, it has to be deduced by good and necessary consequence. Very important statement about the role of logic. If anybody's read a... Um, History of the Reformation, or even seen the movie on Martin Luther, the Hollywood version, the, the 1951 movie, I guess it was. Um, you know that Luther is asked to recant by the powers in the church. He's asked to deny what he's written, deny what he's teaching. And his response is, unless you can convict me that I am wrong by scripture and plain reason, I cannot recant. Luther very clearly appealed to scripture and plain reason, just as the confession here talks about scripture and necessary consequence. They meant the same thing. And Luther's stance was a denial that the church had the authority to add to the Bible by tradition, by oral tradition specifically. And he said, the Bible alone is the word of God. Not the pronouncements of popes, not the pronouncements of councils, not the pronouncements of private men, but the Bible alone is the word of God. And we understand the meaning of the Bible by reading it and by drawing valid inferences from it. Now, to show you that the position of the Westminster Confession is not unique, not unique to those theologians nor to Luther. Let me read a few statements from certain men, some of which I will have up here on the overhead. Uh, but I think it's important that we understand historically what the position of a reformed uh, theologians has been. Uh, for example, the same theologians who wrote the Westminster Confession uh, and who wrote the larger catechism and the shorter catechism wrote also what we would call today a book of church order. It was their rules for Presbyterial church government. And in that document, they included what a candidate, what a person who wished to become a minister had to do to become a minister. And this is what they wrote. He had to be examined. It says, he shall be examined touching his skill in the original tongues and his trial to be made by reading the Hebrew and Greek Testaments and rendering some portion of them into Latin. Not English, but into Latin. And if he be defective in them, inquiry shall be made more strictly after his other learning and whether he hath skill in logic and philosophy. There you have it, 
in the rules that the Westminster divines wrote, the Westminster theologians wrote, uh, at the same time they wrote the confession, examine the ministerial candidates in logic and philosophy. One of the people attending that meeting in London in the 1640s was a young Scotsman named George Gillespie. And if you haven't read anything by George Gillespie, again, run out the door and start reading Aaron's Rod Blossoming. Um, there is a wealth, and I'm going to emphasize this uh, throughout this week, there is a wealth of astoundingly good theology out there waiting to be read and studied and learned by you. Unfortunately, most of it hasn't been written in the 20th century. If you want really good theology, for the most part, you have to go back a century or two. George Gillespie was a young Scotsman who wrote in the 17th century, and this is what he had to say about logic. He said that necessary consequences from the written word of God do sufficiently and strongly prove the consequent or conclusions, if theoretical, to be a certain divine truth which ought to be believed, and if practical, to be a necessary duty which we are obliged unto, and then he used a Latin phrase meaning by divine law. He was defending the idea that the Bible is not merely what is explicitly written there, but also all necessary inferences from it. And that's what the Westminster Confession teaches. It's not merely the words themselves, but all their valid implications that are the word of God. William Cunningham, he wasn't present at the Westminster Assembly. He wrote uh, in the 19th century, and this is what he has to say about logic. It has been the generally received doctrine of orthodox divines, orthodox theologians, and it is in entire accordance with reason and common sense that we are bound to receive as true on God's authority not only what is expressly set down in Scripture, but also what by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. And heretics in every age of every class have, even when they made a profession of receiving what is expressly set down in Scripture, shown the greatest aversion to what are sometimes called scriptural consequences, that is, inferences or deductions from scriptural statements, beyond what is expressly contained in the mere words of Scripture as they stand on the page of the sacred record. And he's quite accurate in that. One of the claims of Arminians throughout the centuries has been we can't draw out the logical implications of these statements. We have to restrict ourselves only to what is expressly stated in Scripture. So Cunningham was correct in that observation. Then there's a statement, and I won't read you the whole thing, by Warfield. I don't think I have a uh, an overhead for it either. Benjamin Warfield was a Princeton theologian. He taught at Princeton Seminary at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. Again, wrote several good books. If you haven't read them, read them. Uh, the name is Warfield, just the way it sounds. And this is what he says about logic. This is the strenuous and universal contention of the Reformed theology against Socinians and Arminians who desired to confine the authority of Scripture to its literal statements. It involves a characteristic honoring of reason as the instrument for the ascertainment of truth. Warfield says, We must depend upon our human faculties to ascertain what Scripture says. We cannot suddenly abnegate them and refuse their guidance in determining what Scripture means. This is, this is not, of course, to make reason the ground of the authority of inferred doctrines and duties. Reason is the instrument of discovery of all doctrines and duties, 
whether expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. But their authority, when once discovered, is derived from God, who reveals and prescribes them in Scripture, either by literal assertion or by necessary implication. Then he goes on and he explains the Reformed view. He said it is the Reformed contention reflected here by the Confession, meaning the Westminster Confession, that the sense of Scripture is Scripture, and that men are bound by its whole sense in all its implications. The reemergence in recent controversies of the plea that the authority of Scripture is to be confined to its expressed declarations, and that human logic is not to be trusted in divine things, is therefore a direct denial of a fundamental position of Reformed theology, explicitly affirmed in the Confession, as well as an abnegation of fundamental reason, which would not only render thinking in a system impossible, but would discredit at a stroke many of the fundamentals of the faith, such as the doctrine of the Trinity, and would logically involve the denial of the authority of all doctrine whatsoever, since no single doctrine of whatever simplicity can be ascertained from Scripture except by the use of the processes of the understanding. The recent plea against the use of human logic in determining doctrine destroys at once our confidence in all doctrines, no one of which is ascertained or formulated without the aid of human logic. Now that's a long statement from Warfield, but he makes it crystal clear what the meaning what the intention of the Westminster theologians was. Nothing, there is no understanding without the use of logic. We emphasized earlier the necessity for the use of the law of contradiction. There is no understanding possible without it. In the 20th century, it's become very common for theologians, starting with the neo-Orthodox theologians, to say that faith must curb logic. That is, we cannot reason, to use their metaphors again, in a straight line. We can reason so far, but then faith has to say, no, we can't believe that conclusion, we're going to believe something else. That is the contention of the neo-Orthodox theologians. The men, of, the men like Karl Barth and Emil Brunner and Rudolf Bultmann, uh, Swiss and German theologians, who, among other things, have denied the inerrancy of Scripture, of the historicity of the resurrection. Unfortunately, most, I won't say most, but many theologians who profess to be Calvinists have adopted that neo-Orthodox view and have denied the view that we have read so far from the Westminster Confession and from older Reformed theologians. Uh, let me continue, though. I've stopped with Warfield. Uh, let me continue with a statement from a Reformed Baptist named Kenneth Good. Now, he, uh, Mr. the late Mr. Good, denied necessary consequence. He wrote a book called Are Baptists Reformed, in which he says, no, they're not. We both believe in sola scriptura, he says, Baptists and Reformed people. But the Reformed people go further, and they add something to Scripture. This was his argument. He says they add necessary consequence. And in so doing, deny sola scriptura. He says, as good Baptists... We don't do that. We don't believe in necessary consequence. We believe in sola scriptura. And let me quote his words, if I might. Uh, he wrote in this book, um, Our Baptist Reformed, he says, while the first five sections of the Westminster Confession state nothing with which Baptists would take issue, section six of the Puritan document introduces a principle to which Baptists cannot subscribe, 
since they believe it to be inconsistent with the basic intent of sola scriptura, meaning the Bible alone. It's a Latin phrase meaning the Bible alone. Contrary to what Holy Writ says about itself, Baptists have no problem with the negative aspect of section 6 when it speaks against papal tradition or against charismatic addition, but they do have a valid objection to the positive aspect of this article as it is employed to justify ecclesiastical positions and practices which are actually extra-biblical. Baptists believe that the Reformed very inconsistently insinuate insufficiency to the scriptures. And then he puts in bold type, large type, the Reformed speak of sufficiency, but they add the theory of necessary consequence. Now this is one of the objections that, in this case, a Reformed Baptist has raised against necessary consequence. Does anybody see any difficulty with the objection? Well, Mr. Good was presuming, of course, that necessary consequence isn't found in the Bible itself. If necessary consequence is found in the Bible itself, then it's not being added to Scripture. And as we shall see later on, it's found in the Bible itself abundantly. Well, let me continue. Yes, sir, go right ahead. I agree. I agree. Necessary consequence is revealed. I, and I should emphasize at this point, I suppose, that philosophers have argued for centuries about the foundations of logic. Uh, I mentioned the name of Aristotle earlier. He first formulated the laws of logical thought, but he had, a main, he had a, an insuperable problem in his philosophy. Aristotle was an empiricist. He believed we learned through the senses. And he could not account for those laws of thought by learning through the senses. Uh, philosophies have differed over what uh, or how to account for these laws of thought. And we ground the laws of thought in revelation, not in sensation. Uh, it is God's thinking. Uh, the laws of thought display the nature of God's thinking, and that thinking is displayed in the revelation he has given us. Skipping a few centuries now, we've gotten, I've given you quotations from the 16th century and the 17th century, the 18th and the 19th century. Let's go back to Augustine. And you'll find some of these quotations on or contained in the Green Book. If you look um, about two-thirds of the way through the Green Book, you'll find many of these quotations. Augustine, uh, Bishop of North Africa, came from the city of Hippo, very small city in North Africa. He wrote, The Science of Reasoning, is a very great service in the searching into and unraveling all sorts of questions that come up in Scripture. The validity of logical sequences is not a thing devised by men, but it is observed and noted by them that may, they may be able to learn and teach it, for it exists eternally in the reason of things and has its origin with God. That was what Augustine thought about logic and reasoning. It's not something devised by men, but has its origin with God. Uh, skipping forward 15 centuries, there's another 19th century uh, theologian, uh, Shedd, S-H-E-D-D. -D. Oh, here, before I get to Shedd, let me put uh, Augustine up here for you. That's the quote I just read to you from Augustine. And by the way, it's uh, it's pronounced Augustine, not Augustine. Saint Augustine is in heaven, and Saint Augustine is in Florida. Um, and this is what Augustine had to say about uh, logic having its origin with God. Shed said, 
uh, Presbyterian theologian in the 19th century. It is important to notice at this point that in respect to the doctrines of Christianity, the office of reason is discharged if it be shown that they are self-consistent. A rational defense of the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, consists in demonstrating that there is no contradiction between the several propositions in which it is stated. To require of the theologian a complete explanation of this truth in proof of its rationality is more than is demanded of the chemist or the astronomer in physical science. And here he is defending a rational explanation of the Trinity. Another 19th century theologian, uh, again, if you haven't read his books, particularly his commentary on Romans, do so, Charles Hodge, uh, another gentleman who taught at Princeton Seminary. He wrote that uh, the first and indispensable office of reason, therefore, in matters of faith is the cognition or intelligent apprehension of the truths pre proposed for our reception. And hurrying on, let me give you uh, Abraham Kuyper, a late 19th, early 20th century Dutch theologian. Kuyper at one point was very active in politics and I believe Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Um, wrote a book on the Holy Spirit, which is very good. And among other things, this is what he had to say about logic. A theologian who undervalues logic as being little necessary to him simply disarms himself. This was by no means the practice of our older theologians. They always emphasized most strongly the study of formal logic together with its related arts. Uh, one of the leading Dutch theologians, uh, Abraham Kuyper. In this century, I might read a sentence or a paragraph from Gordon Clark. Uh, Instead of a series of disconnected propositions, truth will be a rational system, logically ordered series, somewhat like geometry, with its theorems and axioms, its implications and presuppositions. And each part will derive its significance from the whole. Christianity is a comprehensive view of all things. It takes the world to be an ordered system. Another 20th century American theologian, James Buswell, I think I do have his um, on an overhead here. I'll put his statement up here. And this is the reply to uh, Dr. Good who thought that adding logic to Scripture was denying uh, the principle of the Scripture alone. Uh, Boswell says, when we accept the laws of logic, we are not accepting laws external to God, to which he must be subject, but we are accepting laws of truth which are derived from God's holy character. If we accept the triune God as revealed in the Bible, it follows that we accept propositional truth and the laws which are inherent in the nature of propositional truth. These laws are not imposed upon our basic presupposition but are implicit in it and received from it. The Bible is a book in human language. If we are not talking nonsense, we must then believe in the rules of linguistic expression. The Bible, as a book written in human language, claims to speak the truth. If the word truth is not meaningless, it implies the laws of truth, that is, the laws of logic. And that's Buswell on logic. I'm taking you through all these to emphasize the point that the Westminster Confession represents Reformed theology accurately. I've given you six or eight or ten uh, Reformed theologians speaking on logic. And when later in the week we talk about some contemporary theologians who say they're Reformed but attack logic, we can see that they are speaking out of this body, out of this school of thought. And that's very important to recognize that. The theologians I've suggested to you are um, represent most of the mainstreams uh, of 
uh, Reformed theology. And finally, in response to uh, Dr. Good, we may quote uh, the great Reformed Baptist theologian John Gill. And if you haven't read John Gill, drop this class and go read The Cause of God and Truth. John Gill is a brilliant theologian, a Reformed Baptist, and this is one of the things he says about necessary consequence or logic. Nor is, he begins in the middle of a sentence, nor is every doctrine of the scripture expressed in so many words. As the doctrine of the trinity of persons in the Godhead, the eternal generation of the Son of God, his incarnation and satisfaction, etc., but then the things signified by them are clear and plain. And there are terms and phrases answerable to them, or they are to be deduced from thence by just and necessary consequence. What he's saying, if I can paraphrase him, is, there may not be any portion of scripture which teaches in so many words the doctrine of the Trinity. We derive the doctrine of the Trinity by combining statements, explicit statements, taken from different portions of scripture. Saying so now we come up with one God, three persons. And that's the doctrine of the Trinity. If you look at the Westminster Confession, if you have it open before you, the next chapter, chapter 2, is on the Trinity. And I'm not sure whether this version of the Confession does it or not, but some versions, particularly the one that Pastor Boardwine has in print, has little footnotes. And in those footnotes, you'll find printed out all the scripture verses supporting those doctrines. It's not something that these men conjured up. But what they did was they took different premises, different statements from parts of scripture, and combined them and drew a conclusion uh, from those premises or from those statements, and came up with such doctrines as the doctrine of the Trinity. One God, three persons. And that's what John Gill is defending here. If we don't do this, if the Westminster Confession is wrong, uh, if all these theologians are wrong, um, then we're left with nothing. We cannot understand the Bible. It's not a choice between the explicit statements of Scripture and a systematic theology derived from those statements by necessary consequence. But we cannot even understand what the explicit statements of Scripture are. We use the same rules of logic, the law of contradiction, the law of identity, the law of excluded middle, in understanding the statements, as we do in drawing the inferences from them. If the laws don't apply in making the inferences, why do they apply in understanding the statements? You, know, you can't have it uh, both ways. You've got to stick with the Reformed view, which I've quoted to you tonight, uh, or abandon Christianity altogether. That's the relationship between the confession and logic. There is no disparagement of logic. There is no depreciation of logic. There is no deprecation of logic. It's regarded as the single most important tool for interpreting scripture. I know of one seminary in the U.S. that teaches logic to its students. One seminary that teaches logic to its students. The Westminster Confession says that it's the single most important tool for the interpretation and understanding of Scripture. If it's not explicitly set down in Scripture, it's to be deduced by good and necessary consequence. The standards for theological education have fallen dramatically from the 17th century. And the church is suffering as a consequence of that. Are there any questions at all? Yes, sir. Mr. Hill, I just started a question from the Jewish tradition for the logic of fire, the church, how they handle the law, how they made much of the Jews, or made differences from what they read, because no 
That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Uh, it would be worth investigating to find out if there was some historical precedent. After all, the, the Old Testament was in print long before Aristotle wrote. If you classify Aristotle as 4th century B.C., uh, the 39 books of the Old Testament were all written by then. Um, so that's a good question. There may very well be, but I don't know the answer to it. And if there was, perhaps it's lost. Any other questions about the Westminster Confession and its relationship to logic? Now, I don't know how many Baptists or Baptist students we have here, but uh, if you're not interested in the Westminster Confession, read the London Confession. Uh, the London Confession of Faith was a confession adopted by Baptists in England, modeled after the Westminster Confession, I think the date was 1689, in which they... Uh, took virtually the whole confession except for they made some changes in the area of church government and of course baptism believing only in the, the baptism of believers uh, but other than that the London Confession is a virtual duplicate of the Westminster Confession and it represents the sort of thinking that uh, John Gill uh, engaged in uh, later on all of these uh, denominations, in their origin, believe basically the same things. All of them were Calvinists, to use the colloquial term, or to use the more modern phrase among Baptists, all of them taught the doctrines of grace. Uh, the distinction was over relatively minor points like church government. Is it to be a congregational government? or a Presbyterian government. Even the Episcopal Church, if you read the 39 articles, uh, it's very much informed by the doctrines of grace. Uh, and our, the names of our denominations came from a time when about all they had to argue about was what form should church government take. They didn't argue about the inherency of Scripture or the Trinity or the Incarnation or the Resurrection or any of those things, it was a relatively minor thing. So we have Congregationalist names and Presbyterian and Baptist. Uh, that's when the denominations got their names and it was over a relatively minor point. So don't think that in talking about the Westminster Confession, I'm talking something that only a few um, harebrained Presbyterians came up with. It's not at all the case. Uh, back at the time of the Reformation and for a century or two afterward, uh, there was a great consensus among Protestants what the truth was. A great consensus. That consensus was carried over to America in the 18th century uh, and in its founding. So I don't want to be misunderstood as saying this is just Presbyterian. It's not by any means. Any other questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Is there any sort of movement by the Southern Baptist sort of logic? Obviously, I mean, you obviously would have to make a sense of that. Of course, there's any renewal of that. Well, as I say, I know of only one that is doing it, and that has begun only within the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. They use the Clark text uh, as as the textbook for the course. Seminary. Whitfield Seminary in Florida, named after George Whitfield. Now, I may be ignorant, and if, if I am, please correct me. If somebody knows of a seminary that teaches logic to its students, I'd be delighted to hear of it. Yes, sir. Oh, they do? Oh, that's... Okay. Well, the, the name of Moreland I'm familiar with. I'm not sure of who the other gentleman is. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And that's in California, right? It's not a Presbyterian seminary. I think it's Baptist. Is it independent? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Well, I hope I haven't confused you all. Um,
If you would do your homework assignment then, the test on 101 and pages 1 through 6 in the workbook. If you don't have the workbook, feel free to copy the pages. When we come back together tomorrow at 4 o'clock, we will first go over uh, that homework assignment. And then we'll start talking about informal fallacies. Thank you very much.